Good morning. morning. I want to take a moment to welcome you here to worship at the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville, whether you're gathered with us here in person or if you're with us online. Uh, We're glad that you're here this morning. We've got a number of uh, visitors with us and uh, those uh, dressed in their scout uniforms. Uh, Today is Scout Sunday. More on that in just a moment. Uh, And so I want to say a special welcome uh, to you if you're visiting with us. Uh, If you are visiting with us, we'd love for you to take one of those Connect cards in the pew rack there in front of you and uh, fill that out. You can place that in the offering plate later in the service as those plates come around. And that's kind of our way of uh, recognizing your attendance with us uh, and so that we can welcome you fully. And of course, if you're with us online and you're uh, worshiping with us for the first time, we'd invite you uh, to use the chat in that same way. Uh, There is a lot to cover this morning in our announcements, Uh, and so I want to begin. I mentioned that today is Scout Sunday. Uh, There are a number of scouts who are with us, and of course their parents uh, have joined them. You'll notice some of them are helping as ushers and greeters. They're going to help a little bit later with the collection for Super Bowl of Caring. I also wanted to lift up Abby, who is, uh, I just know her by first name, apparently, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who's helping to lead worship with us this morning. And Abby is a den leader and the religious, tell me again. Religious emblem officer. The religious emblem officer. And so she works with uh, scouts who are looking to get a, a religious uh, emblem badge. Badge, right? I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, and so, Abby, thank you for being with us. And thank you to all of the scouts who have joined us uh, for worship uh, today and those who are helping Uh, It's our opportunity to really lift up and celebrate that partnership that we have uh, for many years with our uh, scouts and uh, the work that they're doing. Uh, Truly, we are, they are part of us, uh, and so we hope that you feel welcomed this morning. Uh, Many of you uh, might have shown up this morning looking to hear from Aaron Rafferty, uh, our guest preacher and adult education leader this morning. Uh, Hopefully you saw in the E! News that we had to unfortunately postpone that event Uh, due to sickness in Aaron's home. So uh, please remember her and her family in your prayers and look for an updated date on that uh, soon. Uh, Be aware that today is also Camp and Conference uh, Sunday, Camp and Conference Sunday, and our congregation in particular is a long history and relationship with Camp Johnsonburg. Um, And uh, so we really want to uh, lift that up. I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with Camp Johnsonburg, find somebody who is. There's a lot of people here in this congregation who have been involved uh, in camp in many ways. Ask them about it. Check out their website. Uh, They have been a longtime partner in our ministry, uh, and so we celebrate them this day as well. I'd like to take a moment to thank everybody who showed up yesterday for our indoor cleanup day. Uh, and speaking with Jeff and with Andrea, there were over 20 people that showed up, and Andrea said everybody worked really hard. There were maybe a couple people slacking off, but she wouldn't tell many names. Uh, so they, uh, the folks who volunteered here worked in the meeting house. Uh, they washed and cleaned pews and windows and heater vents, polished front doors and brass, uh, vacuumed pew cushions. There was work done in the kitchen. Things were washed and organized. Uh, cabinets were repaired. Cabinets were prepared for construction. There was a ton of work uh, that was done here uh, yesterday, and you were all saints. If you were here yesterday and don't mind standing, uh, just for a brief round of applause, please, if you were here yesterday, would you stand for a second? All right, these are the people. If they miss a spot, let them know. Uh, I want to say also thank you Uh, For your generosity last week as Pastor Luke and Ronid visited with us as we celebrated the start of our Haiti Mission Month here at the church. Uh, As of our e-news, and you have these numbers in your order of worship, uh, we uh, collected, raised, uh, the amount donated, we we collected almost $4,500 for our general Haiti ministry fund, almost $4,000 for the support of student fund, almost $5,500 for the missionary fund. And of course, on behalf of the congregation and through our mission committee stewardship, we presented Pastor Luke with uh, a check for $1,000. And we also sent him with a check uh, with uh, money from our account from last year with another $8,000. So I don't know the math in my head. It's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of zeros. Uh, But I wanted to say thank you for your uh, generosity and continued support 
uh, in partnership with Pastor Luke and Harmony Ministries, uh, especially these days with everything that's going on in Haiti. Uh, we have, you have certainly been very generous. Uh, it's, there's information in your order of worship about Harmony Ministries and ways to get connected and involved, and of course it's not too late to donate if you have yet uh, to do that. Um, this coming Wednesday, August 14th, is a big day, right? It's Ash Wednesday. It might be something else. I don't know. <laughs> February, did I say August? <laughs> February 14th. It's February 14th. The joke was just, it, it bombed. <laughs> uh, this Wednesday, February 14th, uh, is Ash Wednesday. And of course, as is our tradition, we open up this space for a noontime, lunchtime drop-in for imposition of ashes and a, a blessing. So we encourage you, if you uh, can get away on lunch, uh, to stop by. Uh, if not, or even if so, we encourage you to come back uh, after your, uh, you know, your, your lovely dinner out. Uh, join us at 7 p.m. for a brief uh, service of worship that will feature a variety of music, some storytelling, uh, and uh, prayer, and of course the imposition of ashes. It's uh, a service of worship for people of all ages. It'll be intergenerational, and we hope that you'll join us for that service as we start the season of Lent uh, together. Next Sunday, two things I want to make sure you're aware of, okay? Uh, following uh, worship, immediately following worship, we're going to have a brief meeting of the Congregation and Corporation uh, for the purpose of passing two corporate uh, resolutions to secure our loan from the Presbyterian Investment and Loan Program. So this is uh, hopefully not new news to you. If you've been following along and participating in our congregational meetings, uh, you know that we are securing a loan uh, for some of our cash flow as we prepare for the start of uh, our construction. That loan will be paid off once uh, that money continues to come in with our capital campaign. Uh, but there's some paperwork that needs to be signed, so uh, please join us next Sunday immediately following worship for that brief meeting. And as well, next Sunday, uh, you're invited to join us for a program with uh, Light of the World Family Church in Hamilton. Uh, we're going to lift up and celebrate the work of our Work Well Partnership uh, ministry. You know, we started that ministry for returning citizens, and it has grown, obviously, beyond us uh, into something that's been really significant uh, to those who have been involved. Many here have been involved. So come, hear stories, uh, come, find ways to get involved, come, uh, celebrate that work. It originally was scheduled as a potluck. The Order of Worship says it's a potluck. I'm told we don't have to bring anything. We just have to show up hungry. Uh, so please come and look for more information on that. Of course, there's lots of announcements in your order of worship in the e-news about the start of Lent, about our children and youth ministry programs, our community choir, all kinds of other things going on. Uh, before I invite Alicia up for our moment of generous living, I also wanted to take this moment to uh, invite Will to come and join me here. Will is our uh, new adult education intern and officially begins today. Many of you might have had the chance uh, to meet him. Will, say hello. Hey. Uh, his bio is in the order of worship, uh, and of course, we hope that you'll join us in lifting Will in prayer as he begins his ministry among us. Thanks, Will. <clears throat> uh, so at this time, I'd invite Alicia to come forward to share with us a moment for mission. Good morning. Do you know what today is? It's Sunday, but it's also a special Sunday because it is the day where the biggest football game of the year is played. We are luckily hours away from kickoff or we would likely be missing many of our members. One of my favorite things about the Super Bowl is the snacks. Can you guess how many snacks are going to be eaten today during the big game? Guess, a lot. <laughs> So approximately 112 million pounds of food, 112 million pounds of food will be eaten during the big game. My favorite Super Bowl snack is wings. Can you guess how many wings will be consumed? <laughs> guess, how many do you think? 1.4 billion, 1.4 billion wings. While many of us may have the privilege to eat a lot during the big game, there are over 39 million Americans who are food insecure. 39 million Americans without soup in their bowls today. That means they don't have enough food to eat today or any day. As a community, we can and are doing something about it. 
The Super Bowl of Caring, which we celebrate today, started over 30 years ago to help neighbors in need have, to have soup in their bowls. So today, after service, our children and youth will be standing at the exits with soup bowls waiting to take your donations. If everyone who watched the big game today donated just $1, that would be $200 million in one day to tackle hunger. Every dollar or non-perishable food item that is donated today will go to support our giving pantry, which is located at the exit of the church. Every dollar makes a difference. Please join me in supporting our neighbors in need. Please join me in our call to worship this morning. Cry out. Cry out. Cry out. Let us worship God together.
God of grace and glory. To this world wor wor worried world, you reveal your presence in radiant glory and in gentle whispers, on mountaintops and in shadowed valleys, in classrooms and hospital beds, in homes and churches, in the quiet of nature and on busy streets. Yours is the presence that pushes past our fear to calm us. Yours is the love that transforms our doubt with reassurance. We come to dwell in your goodness and to offer you the praise you deserve. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that many things keep us from trusting fully in your love. We are often distracted by our own desires and disappointments. <coughs> we cling to anger and resentment. We fear for the future rather than seek signs of hope. Let us take a moment now of silence to lift up our own individual confessions. Forgive us. Shine your love upon us so that your glory may be seen in us and give us courage to follow Jesus wherever he leads. In your name we pray these things. Amen. I invite all who can stand to please stand with me as we receive the assurance and forgiveness and pardon. Hear what comfort God offers us. We are God's own children, made heirs, forgiven, and freed to start anew. In Christ, we are given a new life. So let us live our lives with love and joy and knowledge. Thanks be to God. Amen. Adults, you may be seated, and I would invite any children present to come forward for our time with children. Good morning. I know there's more kids out there. You're more than welcome to come up, or if you're more comfortable in your pew, stay there. Um, I am excited this morning to share with you one of my favorite parables, one of my favorite stories that Jesus tells, okay? And it comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, okay? In this story, there is a king, okay? And the king, we can assume, is Jesus, okay? And Jesus is talking to a group of people, and he says that when you fed me, or when I was thirsty, you fed me. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was sick, you came and visited me and took care of me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. Now, the people were a little bit confused because they were thinking, I never gave Jesus water. I never gave Jesus food. I never visited Jesus when Jesus was in prison or took care of him when he was sick. And you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, truly I tell you, just as you did this for the least of me, so somebody who was hungry, somebody who was thirsty, somebody who was sick or in prison, you did it for me. So what I love about this scripture is that it reminds us that God calls us to actively engage in the world around us. God, call, the scripture reminds us that in our service to other people, we are in fact serving God. 
So just a few minutes ago, I talked about our Super Bowl of Caring drive that we do today. And today, our congregation has a special opportunity to live out God's call to serve others through this Super Bowl of Caring drive. So as we head out to Sunday school, I encourage you to think about ways that you, the children of this church, the children of God who are sitting before me, um, can let God's love shine in the world today and every day. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you. We are thankful to be, a part, be able to participate in the Super Bowl of Caring. We ask that you bless people everywhere who are hungry and help us to help them. Help us to remember Jesus' words, I was hungry and you gave me food, thirsty and you gave me a drink, and just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it for me. Amen. So for my friends who maybe haven't been here in a while, who have never been here, we get to stand up and all of the adults and people who stay in worship give us a blessing and then we say back to them, may the Lord be with you here, okay? Can you guys say that with me? May the Lord be with you here. So let's stand up and face our friends of the church. Okay, and the congregation says, May the Lord be with you there. And the children say, May the Lord be with you here. So we're going to head out to Sunday school. We're going to follow Patrick, if you are willing to go. Our gospel reading today comes to us from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw that with them any more was no one, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, be with us this day as we gather together, as your church and as your people, as we gather together around the hearing and proclamation of your word. We pray that your spirit would be with us and that we might leave this place a changed people, God, for we know we cannot encounter your spirit and stay the same. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be pleasing to you, for you are a rock and our redeemer. Amen. So uh, I was really proud of myself this week uh, because I had a sermon written, mostly, uh, by Thursday afternoon. And that doesn't always happen. Uh, and then I watched uh, the movie Moana on Thursday night. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Moana. Uh, and it really messed up my whole plan. <laughs> Uh, for my sermon this Sunday uh, in a big way. So in some ways, this is a confession that I'm still kind of reflecting and wrestling with this scripture text, and it's been really bothering me all weekend. 
I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Moana, uh, but it's uh, about this young teenage girl who uh, lives uh, with her family and in a community, uh, a, a kind of Polynesian island uh, surrounded by a reef. And, uh, and they have what they need. They've made a life there, a home there for many, many years. Her dad is the sort of king, uh, the leader of the community, uh, and is kind of training her uh, to uh, take over eventually. Right? And there's a way to do things. There's a life there. But her grandmother, uh, who is obviously a little bit older, a little bit wiser, has this connection to sort of the stories of their people. Uh, she has this connection to their history and, and uh, to the ocean and uh, to the life beyond the reef. And she uh, is constantly telling all the kids. One of my, my favorite scene in the whole movie is right at the beginning. And she's telling this terrifying story of these beasts, you know, to these little children who are just a few years old. And all the kids are crying except Moana, who's got this big smile on her face. Uh, and they all freak out. Um, but it sparks something in Moana. And the, this, the movie, you know, if you've not seen it, I don't want to ruin it for you. Because everybody, I'm sure, has nothing else to put on the TV this afternoon. Uh, but, you know, there's some other complications that mean Moana has to set out. Uh, on this voyage to save her people. Uh, but it's really interesting. The thing that most interests me about this movie is that more than uh, what she does to save her people, it's really about uh, this discovery of her own identity and her own self. And it's rooted in who she is as part of this community, part of this uh, people, right? And uh, she comes to this realization that it's not because things are bad on the island, right? There's a whole music as is the case in Disney, right? They break into song to explain a point that life on the island is actually good. They have everything they need. There's joy and there's meaning and there's life there. And she comes to discover that, that right here there's happiness and yet there's something that she can't just put aside. She has this encounter as a kid and later uh, with the ocean um, and it's, it's calling to her. And there's something deep in her bones, in her gut, that says there's something beyond the reef. There's something more out there, and I can't ignore it. And so that's, to me, the deeper meaning of this movie, beyond the fact that she has to save her people. Right? Because her people, years ago, were voyagers. They were sailors. They set out, and they moved from island to island, and they uh, tracked their way through the stars and, and had this... Uh, long history uh, is sort of in her. It's rooted in her. And as I watched this movie on Thursday, uh, I tried to, you know, talk with my children about it. They didn't get it. Uh, and, uh, you know, my wife, most of the time, will entertain my theological musings, but most of the time says, Kyle, it's just a Disney movie. We got to make dinner. Uh, <laughs> But I can't help but think that there is a transfiguration moment in that movie. I kept thinking, this is the transfiguration for me. And I, I struggled to kind of put some words to it in many ways. This morning, I think probably I'm still struggling to put some words to it. Uh, but I can't help but think about it. You see, if we're being honest, this transfiguration text, and it, it comes up in the lectionary every year. It shows up in three of the four Gospels. Uh, it's very similar in each account. We preach on it often. We put out the white Bible markers and put on the white stole. And it's a day in the church, the transfiguration of the Lord. Uh, and we feel like there's something significant happening. Even as we read that text, right? There's something significant, palpable in it that we know something is happening here of significance even if we struggle to articulate exactly what that is. Almost like a word that's on the tip of our tongue, but we can't quite get it out. I was listening to a podcast this week, uh, and as I was uh, working to write this sermon, and, and one of the, uh, the hosts on the podcast is a New Testament scholar who focuses his research in the Gospels, and he said, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years, and I still don't know what to do with the transfiguration. So I feel a little less pressure now <laughs> to have it figured out. But it feels like there's something really significant happening here 
and this text, and it happens, and then all of a sudden, it's, it's over. Just as quickly as it happens, it's over, and it's the disciples, and it's Jesus once again. And there's this moment that they have to figure out, what's next? Where do we go from this moment? And I encourage you to think about in your own lives those kinds of moments, whether they're religious or not, those kinds of moments that happen. And just as you're figuring out there's something really important going on here, the moment is past. But it's changed you, right? In our staff meeting this week, Jeff joked about, you know, I was thinking about the, the first time I held hands with a girl. I was thinking about that moment, uh, you know, the first time I told my wife I loved her, or maybe more poignant, the first time she told me she loved me. I remember, uh, you know, holding my children and two, two young kids, and there's a moment, if you've ever raised children, you know, when they're babies, it's almost like a thing that's just in your house. It kind of occupies space, and when they're first born, they don't really make eye contact, they kind of stare past you a little bit. But as their eyes develop, right, there's that moment where they recognize you, they look at you. And then there's that moment where they squeeze your finger or squeeze your hand, right? Or that first time they fall asleep on your chest, that's my favorite, and my son wrestles with me every time. I say, you're gonna sleep here? And he says, Dad, I'm eight. <laughs> what are those moments that happen that are so profound and formative in our lives that we just can't ignore, even if we struggle to put words to it, we know that whatever it was has formed us and shaped us and we will not be the same. I think that's a transfiguration moment for us. That's what's happening here in the Gospel of Mark, right? And this is a, a transition text in the Gospel of Mark. Just before, in the end of chapter 8, we get this uh, sentence. The Gospel writer says, Then, or at that time, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be killed, and after three days rise again from the dead. This is the first in a cycle of three predictions in Mark's gospel where Jesus predicts or foretells his suffering and resurrection. And it really, in many ways, represents a significant turn in the gospel of Mark or in any gospel that it's found, right? It's a shift away from Jesus' ministry toward what's coming. And in Mark's gospel, this also follows Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ. And so from this time on, moving forward in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus begins to foretell his death and his resurrection. It's time that Jesus starts to lay some of his cards out on the table and to bring the disciples in on what exactly it is that God is doing. He's not just the same Messiah that everybody expected, but here's what that means. And what's more is even right before this encounter, Jesus goes on to say to his disciples, if any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. And so the disciples are trying to process all of this, and that's when Jesus takes Peter and James and John, and by extension all of us through this scripture reading, with him up a mountain, and suddenly there he's transfigured. And transfiguration is kind of an interesting word choice here. I think it's an intentional word choice. It doesn't show up that often in the Bible, only four times, actually. It's a word that can also be used uh, uh, or translated as a transform or change, and that's how the Apostle Paul uses it in the book of Romans and 2 Corinthians. But both here, the translators of Mark and Matthew are careful to say transfigure. Uh, and I would say, go even as far to say that it's an important distinction that, uh, or it's such an important distinction that in the Gospel of Luke, the word isn't even used lest there be any kind of confusion. But rather, Luke's gospel just says, the appearance of Jesus' face changed. Literally, the fashion of his countenance was, countenance was altered. 
And so all that is to say that transfiguration is not the same thing as transformation, although it may lead to transformation. Even though Jesus is transfigured, the disciples have no problem recognizing him, right? Peter calls out to him and says, Rabbi, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. This event, this transfiguration, is not about Jesus becoming something that he never was or becoming something new, but rather it's about a fuller revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. And for those present, for Peter and for James and for John and for us, in this moment, we're left to wrestle with what it means to follow Jesus. What it means to listen to him is the voice of God instructs, right? What's next? How are we changed by this experience? And what comes next? Of course, we know Peter responds and is often criticized for his response. Commentators often suggest that Peter uh, didn't know what to say or he spoke when he should have listened. Uh, We often criticize Peter for saying he just wants to hold on to that mountaintop experience. But I would push back. Now, the text is clear that Peter doesn't know what to say. Actually says the disciples were terrified. And yet in the face of uncertainty, in the face of doubt, in the face of fear, Peter doesn't let that stop him from doing something. We're told that Peter wants to build three dwellings or three tabernacles in response to Jesus' transfiguration. In the Jewish tradition, the tabernacle was the place where the very presence of God dwelled, and it's where God was worshipped. And so if we're able to kind of hear the echoes of that tradition in this passage, then Peter's response is actually an act of acknowledgement of the divine presence in Jesus. It's an act of worship. We might say that Peter gets it. And yet, all that to say, God's voice still interrupts Peter as if to say, I won't be contained here on this mountaintop, and neither will you. There's some nuance here that I love that... uh, often I find difficult to follow, but I'm gonna try it, and we're gonna go on this journey together. This transfiguration experience, you know, happens between Jesus and the disciples. Peter makes this confession of who Jesus is, and Jesus leads them up, right? And Jesus isn't transformed into something new, so it's the same Jesus who is with them prior to this experience, who is with them at the transfiguration, and the same Jesus who will be with them afterward. Our calling as Christian people, our calling to follow Jesus, our instruction from the very voice of God here is to listen to Jesus, to follow Jesus. He leads the disciples up to the mountaintop, but then leads them back down in the valley below. And I think there's encouragement in that. Right? It's the same Jesus. God is still present. God is still leading. But where is God leading us? Beyond the mountaintop. Or to put it in the context of Moana, beyond the reef. There's something intrinsic in our uh, identity as the people of God, as people of faith, that calls us, beckons us beyond the mountaintop. And so I think this transfiguration moment is an invitation into a kind of creative reimagining what it means to follow Jesus. Not in the comfort of the mountaintop, but rather back down in the valley below. And so like Peter and James and John, and maybe even a little bit like Moana, we're confronted with this same question, this question that we've asked, right? What's next? This is the same question I think we've been asking as a congregation, uh, especially and in particularly with our our, uh, construction on the horizon. What's next? Where is God calling us? Right? There's nothing wrong with the mountaintop. 
There's nothing wrong with Montanui, which is the island where Moana lives, and yet something in us is calling us beyond. What's next for us as a congregation? Like the disciples, we're never meant to stay on the mountaintop. The trip up the mountain prepares each of us to travel back down. Uh, In fact, I think the saving significance of God's action in Jesus Christ is the very thing that beckons us down the mountain, that beckons us beyond these walls out into the community. As a church, I think we're called to take that mountaintop experience down into the valley below. The grace and the love that we've experienced, the grace and the love that we proclaim here from the pulpit in our worship, in our prayers, is meant to be taken with us out into the community. And there's a whole lot of reasons why we wouldn't do that. There's a whole lot of reasons that would keep us from acting, right? The doubt, the fear, the uncertainty. In the, in the movie Moana, her dad says, you can't go beyond the reef because it's too risky. Right? We don't know what the future holds for our congregation as we seek to follow the discernment of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's risky. It's dangerous work sharing the gospel with the community. But unlike the disciples who were told not to tell anyone what they saw, we know how the story ends. The story ends with resurrection. This moment which reveals the very presence of God with us in the person of Jesus Christ is the same moment which cuts through the darkness and reveals a new way of relating to one another, a new way of being in the world together. Uh, I wanted to end with this. I've shared this with you before uh, a few times, but one of my favorite scripture passages uh, from the message translation comes from Romans chapter 8. And it says something like this. This resurrection life which we've received is not a timid, grave-tending life, but rather it's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? In many ways, I think this moment is for me, as I hope it is for you in our shared life together here at PCOL, a transfiguration moment. As we think of all that we've accomplished, all that we've done, as we think of this experience Sunday after Sunday, something in us beckons us forward, calls us forward out into the community, to the valley below, to the community well, to whatever it is that God is calling us to, to speak words of hope and love and grace and meaning, to be a catalyst for real, authentic community where others might come to know and discover their true selves. So what's next? Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please join in saying the affirmation of faith found in our order of worship. As people of faith and crew, as disciples, we trust in Jesus Christ, holy human, holy God. Jesus proclaimed reigning in God, preaching good news to the poor, and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and thus and children, healing the sick, binding up broken hearted, eating the outcasts, forgiving the sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Let us bow our heads and open our hearts as we come before God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we come before you, you who know our hearts, because you created us and formed us before we were in our mother's womb. You are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. We are told that when we begin with a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving, there is a certain perspective that falls over us. It is though the worries and anxieties in our minds are lessened in that moment. So in this time of prayer, we thank you for all that we have this day, our friendships, our family, and especially this faith community. We thank you for the ministry of Will Abbott, his gifts and his calling to participate in ministry here at PCOL. We thank you for the scouts and the leaders who model and shape our youth and adolescents with their dedication and endless support. O oh, Holy One, we thank you for this body with members that are your hands and feet, your head and heart. For when we are together doing your work, we begin to experience in tangible ways the love of your son, Jesus Christ. God of mercy, our hearts remain heavy with the ongoing devastation of war around the world. We are disheartened by the acts of evil that bring death and pervasive trauma to thousands of children and families who suffer needlessly. Help us in our disbelief when our hearts are saddened and we feel helpless and disconnected. May these words of prayer and the feelings that lay deep in our hearts mean something. Help us to know that you dwell with the families who are grieving and that our prayers and laments are heard. We pray on behalf of those who are suffering we ask for continued prayers on behalf of those who live in violence and poverty. We pray for and give thanks to Pastor Luke and Renee, their faithful ministry to the people in Haiti. May our prayers and financial support be multiplied. We earnestly pray that they feel a renewed sense of energy and passion by faithfulness of this congregation and the power of the Holy Spirit. God of grace, no one is beyond the reach of your love or outside your limitless mercy. Move us toward those the world rejects so that we may venture to follow Christ and risk showing his love. Stand with those who feel rejected, strengthen them in peace, encourage them by your presence, and use them to build on the cornerstone of Christ until differences are unrecognizable. God of comfort, companion of the lonely, be with those who feel lonely or alone. Help us to fill empty places with love by encouraging us to visit and share your love and grace. Help us to know what is next what is right in front of us. For we know that sitting in a building each week is never enough. We are called into the world to do hard things that take us out of our comfort zone. Help us to listen, to pay attention, 
and to live into those moments of divine presence in order to follow Jesus. Lord, in your mercies, not only hear our prayers, but speak to us through the words that you taught us to pray and to pray on your behalf. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we approach God with a spirit of gratitude, our offerings become an expression of worship, which are multiplied in the giving of our tithes and offerings. So let us come before God with our time, our talents, and with our financial commitments in order to engage in the work of the church here in Mercer County and in the world. For those worshiping online, you may give by using the blue donate button on the top right corner, or you may also um, see the link in the chat. Let us continue to worship God with these offerings. The ushers may please come forward.
gracious and merciful God, we ask that you bless these gifts which we offer to you out of our grateful hearts. Bless and multiply these resources in order to do the work of the church, creating a more just and peaceful world. Allow our time and talents to bring love and healing to all who need it. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please extend a peace with your neighbor. So friends, our final hymn is in your bulletin. Now this is one of the most famous Southern Gospel songs ever written by Hank Williams. Uh, so our quartet is going to, our little ensemble up here is going to sing the verse, uh, the verse part, and you're welcome to come in on the chorus. And if you want to sing on the verse part, do that too. I mean, we're Presbyterians and the Spirit might break forth among us, and you might even, you might even want to clap at some point. I'm just saying, maybe. All right, here we go. We're going to have to work on the clapping thing a little bit, okay? <laughs> I have been told that the scouts don't leave. We really would love everybody to come to fellowship hour, but before you do, if you're a scout family, uh, there's going to be a group picture up here. Over to you, Kyle. Okay. And you have to sing and clap at the same time <laughs> for the photo. Uh, in this case, the light is just the camera flash. Uh, friends, I hope that we ended that service on a high point, a moment of joy. Uh, you know, I know it's not everybody's cup of tea to sing some Southern Gospel, but it is uh, a lot of fun, I think. And my hope is, as this service of worship comes to an end, uh, we leave here on a high note.
We leave here holding joy in our hearts, trusting and knowing that it's the Spirit of God that beckons us out beyond these walls. And none of us knows what we'll face this week, and for many of us, it'll be great joy, uh, but for others, it'll be hardship. Whatever it is that we face, we don't face it alone but we face it with the grace and the strength and the love of the Almighty God who is with us in the valley and at the mountaintop and in the valley again. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship and the community of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and every day. Amen. Amen.